Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Divorced Woman's Guide podcast. How are you doing today? As a reminder, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode when it drops every single week. And today's episode, I am here with my dear, dear friend, Michelle of Moms Moving On. Hello, Michelle. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me back. Love seeing you. I know. I'm so excited for you to be here. And I am so looking forward to discussing your new book, Moms Moving On, Real Life Advice on Conquering Divorce, Co-Parenting Through Conflict, and Becoming Your Best Self. So before we dive in, I'm going to remind our audience uh, a little bit about you. So (laughs) Michelle Dempsey Moltak is a writer. She's a CDS, which is a certified divorce specialist, a mom, a coach, speaker, and genuine girl power enthusiast. She also has her weekly podcast that she hosts called Moms Moving On, and she does write regularly for parents, Scary Mommy, and a host of others. She is a former New Yorker and now lives in Miami with her husband, daughter, and stepdaughter. And her first book, as I mentioned before, just released on March 15th. And again, it's called Moms Moving On, Real Life Advice for Conquering Divorce co-parenting through conflict and becoming your best self. Michelle, I know that this has been a passion project of yours going on behind the scenes for a couple of years. So I would love for you to share with our audience today, what inspired you to write this book and to finally publish it? Oh, well, that is a fully loaded question. Because to be honest, I think I've been writing this book my whole life in different versions in my head. I am the product of a horrible divorce. I was eight years old when my parents split. I was 18 when they finalized the divorce. So it was just a big lesson on what not to do in the divorce process and in co-parenting. From my dad's side, my mom was sort of like, you know, just there trying to manage and survive and take care of us while all this was going on. But as I found myself in a marriage that wasn't working out, I thought to myself, well, damn, like I know this has to end, but I could never navigate it without having had the experience I had as a child and without having my mom and her input on how I'm going to get through this. And I was lucky to have that. But I realized very quickly, as soon as I got separated and started writing about divorce and co-parenting for the mommy outlets and posting about it on social media, that everybody was in the dark. Like All of the content out there, books were geared towards women who were older, women who were in their 40s and 50s, gray divorce, starting over, or the books were very rote and prescriptive and full of legal jargon and didn't really hit to the core of what it meant to be in your early 30s, a mom with young kids, all your friends are still married, still having babies, and here you are going through the divorce process. So I knew I had to write it, but that was also five years ago. It took me a while to, to come to terms with what the book really needed to be. There was so much of my personal experience as a child that I wanted to include because for me, it's important that my followers and readers know, you know, I'm super transparent Mm -hmm. for them to know that like, I own the fact that I entered my first marriage deeply flawed and unhealed because of my childhood. And essentially that led to the person I am today. But then I realized this book didn't have to be about me. People needed a step-by-step guide on what to do. So there are 27 chapters from the minute it's over to the first night you're alone without your kids to understanding the legal process and when and how to figure out your parenting plan. It's every little step of the way that I I could have used when I was when I was divorcing. So somebody recently called it the Bible for divorcing moms, but I I appreciate that. I'd like to say it's more of like a what to expect when you're expecting. So at each stage, you have a guide and my personal tidbits on how I got through it and what the expert suggests and, and everything in between. Yeah. And I think that that's so important. And I know that you and I talk about this a lot, which is that, you know, it's so important to seek out advice and support from people who have been through this. And to your point, there really wasn't a lot of information out there. Even if there was, it was in all these millions of different places where you had to go and actually search it out. And I love that you have put so much knowledge and information into one place for people. So when it comes to 
you know, there's people listening to the podcast who are thinking about divorce, who are in the middle mm-hmm. of divorce, who maybe are even on the other side. What would you say to them, you know, going back to when you were in that place, like, what would you say to the people listening to the podcast who are kind of in the thick of it or about to enter the thick of it? What is the best piece of advice that you could give them that you wish you had given yourself? Don't leave this marriage thinking that leaving it means the way your ex behaves is going to stop. The person who needs to change after the end of the marriage is you, not because you did anything wrong in the marriage or because the end of your marriage was your fault, but more because you have to learn to change, to adapt to what it means to now divorce and parent with somebody you are no longer in love with, you no longer trust, who may or may not be high conflict, who's making your life hell. There is a lot of work you have to do. So I wish somebody would have told me back then, Don't spend your energy trying to change your ex or how he feels or his perspective on how things went down because you're bound to have two different perspectives. Focus on yourself and arming yourself emotionally to deal with all that's coming next. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we don't necessarily understand until we've been through it or you're receiving support from you, from me, from any of our colleagues is that you know, divorce doesn't mean that the co-parent goes away. They're still very much in your life. And one of the things that I talk about a lot, and I know that you do as well, is that it's about shifting your relationship to that person, Mm -hmm. right? Instead of continuing to show up as like ex-wife, 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 it's, well, now I'm, you know, I'm their mom and you're their dad. And to me, mentally, that kind of creates like that boundary and that separation and also enables you to really create a different dynamic, to create a new relationship and also enables you to heal that much faster, right? Because you're not continuously associating yourself with your ex. Well, here's what I think happens. And I know it happened for me. And I talked to experts in behavior on, on the fact that we as women in our relationships naturally, or or all people in relationships, I should say, seek validation from the person they're with on varying degrees, different levels. Maybe you're an anxiously attached human being who's super needy like I was, or maybe you're just like a regular securely attached person, but wants some validation from the person that they're sharing a life with. That doesn't go away when you get separated. And the more they're saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. This was you. I didn't do that. You're like, wait, no. I need you to hear me out and tell me I'm right. And you still are seeking that validation. And so the second you can say to yourself, okay, this is, this validation is an inside job. I don't need them to tell me I'm right. or justified in my feelings. I don't need to tell them anything ever again, or they don't, I don't need anything from them in order to be okay. The sooner you can shift into the role of co-parents and not just ex-wife. I think that's where a lot of people get stuck. I know I did. Oh, I 100% did. And I was, was, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I kept thinking either I can still change him or maybe he's a different person. Or they- if I send this one last 40 page text, it's going to sink in. Right. Right. Or yes. like, read this article from the experts. <laughs> then you'll change. It's ridiculous. And we all do it. And it comes back to from the other side, you know, but it's like, God, if we had the power to change this person, we'd probably still be married, right? Like if we could make them think exactly how we wanted them to think. And and that's where I think the hardest part is for women in the beginning. We're emotional. We don't want to fucking be going through this, even if we want to be going through this. And we're trying to take care of our kids and start life over. And there's questions and people and comments from the peanut gallery. And you're just like, oh my God. I I need something to make it easier. So it's really hard to depersonalize and disassociate from the emotional undercurrent that your ex is trying to pull you into. 100%. And I always say that I think we, we spin our wheels trying to control the things that we don't have control over instead of really looking at and focusing on the things that we do. I mean, can you imagine how much time and energy and sanity you would get back from, you know, just focusing on the things that you knew that you had control over. And what I always tell my clients is that you have control over 
your reaction or your response, right? Mm-hmm. That it's all up to you. And, and at the end of the day, it's also not necessarily about proving them wrong or showing them up or, you know, whatever the outcome is that you're looking for. What I always say that it's really about you feeling comfortable being able to look at yourself in the mirror and knowing that you're doing your best every single day and you don't need their permission anymore. Or and validation. I think- a hundred percent. You can't control what they think of you, what they say about you, anything, even with the best of situations, like you're two different people with two different perspectives and outlooks. So that's, that's the bottom line. But I think where women tend to get stuck is, you know, they'll have an ex who will threaten to tell the kids their side of the story, or nice. I'm going to tell people that you did this. And, and that's where you really have to get your ego in check. Number one, your kids are biologically connected to you. They love you. They have their own opinions of you. Anyone who tries to challenge that is going to actually be seen as a threat in in your kid's eyes. If we want to go deeper into parental alienation another day. Right. But other people's opinions, I mean, really don't get you anywhere at this point. So really putting your ego in check and saying, okay, whatever he's saying or however difficult he's making this process for me, like let him, let him, live in a hell of his own making because it really doesn't mean much for me other than a headache. If I let myself have a headache, you know, I know that part's hard because our egos are like, no, don't talk bad about me. Don't say this is all my fault. But I'd love to say just because someone says something doesn't make it true. And, you know, if you just treat it like white noise, that's all it is. Yeah. Which is hard to do, admittingly. Like it took, I think I can say for both of us, it took us some time to learn the skill of doing that. And I think you bring up a really good point, which is the impact that divorce has on our kids. You know, you have a daughter, I have two boys and we both have navigated, you know, it's not just about the co-parent, it's also about navigating and helping your kids through this process. And I know that you talk a lot about, you know, the kid's role in divorce and, you know, how it is that you talk to them, how it is that you Mm -hmm. help them to navigate because, you know, their world is impacted by this. So what can you share with people? I know there's a couple chapters in your book that talks about, you know, the impact of divorce on kids, but what is something that you can share with our audience today that, you know, that they can keep in mind as they're navigating Mm -hmm. this process and, and keeping in mind what this impact is on their children. Yeah. So it's important to remember that our kids are impacted by everything. You know, before you cry yourself to sleep, like swearing that your kids are ruined forever because you're getting divorced, you need to remember that it's not the act of divorce that deeply affects our kids long term. In the short term, yes, they're going to be, their worlds are rocked. Why is this happening? The book gives a step by step guide how to talk to kids at every age. But it also stresses what is the truest fact of all is that if you're presenting as okay in this divorce, if you are being reasonable, if you are not talking bad about dad, if you are, or mom, if you are encouraging their relationship with the other parent, they're going to fare pretty freaking well. And what's hard for them right now is not going to be hard forever. We talk about kids being resilient and adaptable. Yes, they are that if we give them the tools. And so, you know, it's something that Bill Eddy always says, who's like my co-parenting God is one reasonable parent is enough for the kids to be okay, even in a very unreasonable situation. So this idea that the kids are going to be messed up just because you got divorced I I want you to like get that right out of your head. If you're going to choose to talk badly about your ex and fight constantly and always be in this world of like not learning when to pick your battles or or figure out when enough is enough. Yeah, that's going to affect the kids. But how you hold your head above water and how you carry yourself of a as a woman of grace and elegance and and divorced mom class like makes a really big difference for the kids. It absolutely does. And, you know, what comes up for me too, and I know that you've navigated this as have I, which is, you know, also the impact of new partners coming into Mm -hmm. our kids' life, right? Either by your co-parent or through yourself. So um, I know that you're remarried and I'm in a very serious relationship. So what advice and, and, you know, for those people who are listening, who are trying to figure out when do I introduce this new person or mm-hmm. do I tell my kids that I'm dating, you know, what is some of your own personal advice that you'd like to share with our audience around new partners coming into the picture? So first I want to talk about when your ex has a new partner, because 
when you have a new partner, it's great. And like, it's amazing. And everybody's happy. (laughs) And we're going to introduce the kids and yay. The book goes very deep into that too, because that's something, you know, that will also affect the kids. What you can't control is your ex, who he dates, when he introduces them to the kids, unless you have it written in the parenting plan, which I don't suggest. Some people do. I've had clients who do. You have to remind yourself that just because your ex is dating somebody new does not mean you're you're being replaced in your children's eyes. You may be replaced physically in, in the bed next to your ex, but this shiny new person that your kids may get excited about is not mama and never will be. I was the product of growing up with a stepmom. I thought she was great, but at the end of the day, like, give me my mom. So I just want to say that to make people feel better. I want to validate that it's really hard to imagine your children around somebody new, but the the bonus to having a woman in your kids' lives is a woman's touch, maybe some motherly instinct. Sure, she may align herself with your ex in the beginning and seem really freaking horrible, but she'll come around and there's ways of dealing with that. The other side of that is you meet somebody and you're so excited and he's wonderful and you've done the work and you've started your path to healing and you've put your red flag alert out and he doesn't have any of those. So you really love this person and you want to introduce him to your children. There is no appropriate timeline for this. I hate when people are like six months, two years, four seasons. Look, I am somebody who could not have been in a relationship with my husband if he didn't have a certain kind of chemistry with my child. Once I knew that I was in love and this person was probably here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future, I wanted to know that he was as accepting of my little two-year-old in her diapers and her tantrums as he was of his own 10-year-old daughter. So I would say within the first couple of months, it was a very informal park, this is mommy's friend type of thing, just to gauge a little bit of interaction. I think this is okay whenever you feel ready to do it. I don't think it needs to follow a timeline. What I don't think is okay is introducing the person, everybody seeming happy and deciding, great, let's play family, let's play house, let's do Sunday dinner every Sunday. That's too much too soon. And I can say with full confidence, the relationship my daughter has with Spencer and the relationship I have with his daughter was built on time and trust. And it went very slowly. And I was more concerned with my stepdaughter's emotions than I was Bella's because she was two and he could have been the mailman for all she knew. But my stepdaughter was at a very sensitive age. It reminded me of myself when I was her age and my dad brought a new woman into the mix all the time and was like, here, love her. We're going to spend all our time with her. I didn't want to be that in my stepdaughter's eyes. So I took it very slow. And I really want to stress like the more you try and force something, it's not good. You can't force, you know, your kids don't need a forced family setting to be okay. Like they just want natural, safe, comfortable interactions. And if they feel it too forced, they're going to back away. So do it when you feel it's right. Don't introduce them after a week or two, obviously. But when this feels like a settled, healthy, productive relationship and take it as slow as you need to so that everybody feels comfortable. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I have been on both sides. So, you know, I've talked about this before and, you know, my kids were seven and 10 when we separated and my ex-husband all of a sudden brought this new woman who's now his wife into my kid's life, you know, before our divorce was finalized, before they were even wrapping their minds around what was going on. And it was like, all of a sudden it was like, well, now she's spending every waking minute with like, when you're with me, she's with me. And we're this like, family. And my kids were like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. Men do that a lot. Men do that a lot. They do, unfortunately. And, you know, and thankfully, I, you know, I was able to help my kids navigate that. And, you know, clearly I had a lot of emotions around like, of course, how could you not? How are you doing? You know, not regardless of like, you know, sure. It felt a little stingy over here. You know, I'm not going to say that it didn't, but at the same time, I'm like, dude, our kids are like trying to wrap their mind around us not being together. Right. And it's so interesting because I learned so much from the mistakes that he made that when it came time to introduce my now boyfriend or even, you know, my, I was in a prior long-term relationship also, I I got to learn from those mistakes. And Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. You know, I didn't want to necessarily invest myself in this man. If my kids, you know, this didn't work out amongst all of us and the pace, you know, for example, the pace with my kids, 
was very different than the pace with his kids. Why? Mm-hmm. Because he was more newly divorced than I was. His kids were still wrapping their minds around it. And same thing, Michelle, is that, you know, I wanted to tread very carefully with his kids and it took his kids a lot longer to come around to me, but I was patient because we've been there. Right. And, and that's okay. And, and because exactly. you're an evolved woman, you knew that these kids didn't have to love you right off the bat. It's not their job to. You no. really build those relationships with, you, you secure trust over time by exactly. consistently being a good person who doesn't make them feel like their time with their parent is stepped all over. I, I write about this in my book, like blatant what not to do was what right. my parents did. Right. My, I came home from school on a Friday afternoon in June. My, my, my mom and my grandparents... We're sitting outside on my patio. Everybody's crying. I'm like, what's going on? Sit down. Mommy and daddy are getting divorced. Daddy has a new girlfriend. A couple hours later, daddy's in the driveway with new girlfriends to pick me up. I was like, oh. And then she was just in our lives. And the insecurity that gave me. So even if you think, you you know, you found the one, I'm so excited for you. it, It will have longevity if you do it slowly. 60% of second marriages don't work out very often because of issues with the kids. So you want to, you want to be careful. hundred percent. And, and what's the hurry, right? Like, I feel like people think that it, it's, it has to be this like urgent, you know, well, that's our, that's our anxiety of, you know, I, I found the right person. I want to settle down and I want to, I want it to be everything I didn't have in the last relationship. And I think that's natural. I remember feeling those feelings, but I think it's also that's, you know, you get divorced and you start getting over it and everyone around you is like, so we're going to get married again. Are you (laughs) dating anyone? Have you met anyone? And you're like, okay, I guess I just have to show the world that I'm okay. If I'm in like this deep, you know, committed relationship, which is unfair, but that's the way life is, I guess. It is. I know. Well, you know, I'm five and a half years down the roads, you know, yes, I'm in a relationship, but like, no, I'm not remarried yet. And that's, you know, that's my own personal choice and everybody gets to be okay with that. But I think what I'm hearing you say, and, and, you know, what I think people get to understand is that everybody's path will look different and Mm -hmm. that is okay. You know, it's, it's also, you know, sometimes you take two steps forward and then you take four steps back And that's Mm -hmm. okay too, but it's not something that, you know, you should necessarily beat yourself up over. It's part of your path. It's part of your journey, right? One step forward, three steps back, because that's literally what it is. And that's okay. Like that, that's just part of the process. That is okay. It is. And I, I kind of see it more as like a dance, right? It's almost like it's, it's your divorce dance that it's, yeah. It's not that it's bad. It's not that it's good. It's just, it is, that's just the path, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's interesting because so many people, you know, and I'm sure you hear this too. Everyone's like, I just want to be done when the papers are signed. It's going to be done. I wanted to go back to that. I, yes, that was one of the things you said in the beginning, what I would tell a new mom is there is no freaking fire. You don't need to rush this process and run from this marriage. The more you rush, the more mistakes you'll make in your parenting plan, in your marriage settlement agreement, in your financial stuff, and the more disappointed you'll be. As we all know, it's very hard to change these things once the divorce is done. So take your time. I made every mistake. I rushed thinking getting it done would just, you know, solve all my problems. I didn't make thoughtful decisions. I didn't re- I didn't think long term. I was thinking what would be good for right now for my little two-year-old and I. Not realizing that by the time the ink was dried, she'd be three and a half and then five and then seven and life changes. And you have to think long term. You cannot make any of these important decisions emotionally. Put some time between you and the emails that come in from opposing counsel or from your own attorney. Put the phone down when your lawyer texts and suggests some sort of modification. Just put time between it because you have to live with this. This is your essential Bible for the rest of your parenting years. And If you don't like it, too bad, so sad. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. Same thing. I made a couple of mistakes that have cost me way more than it would have had I... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> taking a beat during the process. And, you know, it, it's going it, to, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And for sure. And, you know, hate to break it to everybody, but 
when the divorce is signed off, it's not done. It's not over. You know, there's so much that comes after that, that you don't necessarily realize or focus on. And there's another emotional wave that comes at that point too. Again, regardless, oh, I just got goosebumps, regardless of why your marriage ended, who ended your marriage, there is an emotional component that comes with it that is unexpected. And I'm not saying it's a huge emotional breakdown. I'm not saying that there isn't any emotion, but that's the spectrum that people also don't necessarily understand that, you know, it's not done when it's signed. Yeah. And I don't want that to like scare anyone and, and deter them from taking this next step into the rest of their lives. I will buffer that with, cause I say that all the time and then I'm like, but you should absolutely still get divorced if you want to get divorced. <laughs> I will say that while the divorce doesn't change the fact that you have to interact with this person for the foreseeable parenting future, the way you handle it and handle it in the beginning will set the tone for once it is done. Yeah. If you're, you know, looking for a fight and you want to go to trial and you're litigious and 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 everything is chaotic, that's essentially how your co-parenting relationship will be. If you take a step back and say, Let's put our kids in the middle, not at the center. And I mean, put our kids at the center, not in the middle and make thoughtful decisions for the long term without emotion. Then you're going to fare better off once the ink is dried. Yeah. And, and I will also say that there's also a sense of relief that comes with that too. Um, you know, you feel like you can breathe a little bit deeper at that point as well. And I agree with you. I think that and again, I'm not going to say that I had an amicable divorce. I didn't. And our relationship thereafter was not amicable until I changed, until I showed up differently. Mm -hmm. And so I want to stress to everybody listening to, and as we're wrapping our conversation, is that it's really important to do the work. It's really important to get support from people who have been through it and to really ask for help, to not be afraid because you've not navigated this before. And it's something that you get to have someone holding your hand through the process. So, and here's the last tip I'll give to that point to anybody listening who is like, well, screw this. Why should I have to do the work when he made all the problems? Right. Listen, you wouldn't not run into a burning building to save your child just because your ex was in there. And you have, you have to think of, of this co-parenting relationship right now, like that burning building. If your ex isn't going to put the fire out, one of you has to, or those kids are going to get burned. And that has to be you. And unfortunately, you know, my mom always said, I had to work double time and do all of the work because of how your dad was. And I'll do it again because I raised some pretty damn great children. All it takes is one reasonable parent. If your ex is being unreasonable, all they need is you and you've got this. Just don't let your anger get the best of you. 100%. Because at the end of the day, you also get to create a relationship with your kids. And so many times there's a ripple effect um, for you to get closer to your kids um, and to support them through this and to not necessarily worry about what's happening, what the other parent is doing, but being concerned about your children and showing up as, as that strong, supportive parent that, you know, that we all know we, we are. So, yes, Michelle, I, I know you and I could talk for hours. <laughs> I love that you invited me on to talk about my book. I, I can't even believe I'm here talking about my book. It feels very <laughs> surreal, but yeah, thank you. I'm so proud of you. And it's been such an honor to, to watch you, I mean, over the last couple of years to blossom into the person that you are and to have all the success that you are. And I can't wait to get my autographed wink, wink signed copy from you. Well, I'll see you soon. I at know. The, <laughs> at, the, at the Mrs. To Me Summit. Yes, I would autograph anything for you. Well, and right. I appreciate that. And, and when you say the word success, I measure my success, not in a book deal and not in my podcast or Instagram followers, but in the women that reach out and say, I am so grateful to you. If it weren't for you, Wendy, Kate Anthony, Susan Guthrie, I could not have gotten through this. And I think that's where we all share our success. And so Absolutely. kudos to you as well. Oh, thanks, honey. Absolutely. The lives that we've impacted and changed, that's why we do it. So Absolutely. Oh, I adore you, Michelle. And how can Back people get a hold of this amazing book? 
Where can um, you find so it? it's everywhere. Uh, if you're an Amazon gal, you can prime it on over. It's Kindle and audiobook as well. Barnes and Noble, Goodreads, Simon and Schuster website. It's everywhere. It's also the link in my bio if you want to order it through my Instagram. Amazing. And what is your Instagram handle just in case? At the Michelle Dempsey. My website is momsmovingon.com. I have courses available. You can work with me one-on-one. You can also join our amazing membership community. It's free and we have a great forum and it's positive and educational and informative. So we hope to see you there. Amazing. It is a great community. And Michelle, all of this information will be in in the show notes. And Michelle, again, thank you so much. And I can't wait to read. I can't wait to read the book. I've gotten a sneak peek, but I can't wait to read the rest of it. So thank you for being here today. I would love to know your thoughts. Thank you, Wendy. Of course. And everybody tuning in, I hope that you love today's episode as much as I did. As you know, I always strive to ask questions that I think you guys are thinking in hopes that you walk away with at least, at least one nugget of information that helps you navigate wherever it is that you guys are in your divorce process. Sending you all so much love, light, and joy. I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye, everybody. 